Do we have questions for the panel? Um, I'm going to. Oh, I, 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 yes. Go ahead. I have it. So I'm going to challenge uh, maybe Larry Smart to participate with me in this question. At the beginning of our conference, we were given an example of a young uh, chat, well, I don't know, the uh, high school student or something like that who has searched um, the web and came up eventually with a patentable solution to one of the cancers. Here we had uh, Yulia Panamarenko showing us how to look at all of the data pretty much available in the universe of searchable biological data. And we have Larry Smarr with all of his resources and having his entire uh, genome sequenced and uh, I don't know how many years is this project um, on the same campus. Are you able to do what the high schooler did with the resources of this entire university? And uh, assuming that the answer is no, how actionable do you find this resource within your reach? Well, <clears throat> um, I think they're not the same case. Uh, this uh, is going to be very valuable for <clears throat> actually the scientific research on things like the microbiome or uh, genomics that are just emerging, uh, in which there are uh, you know, many, many different distributed researchers that are creating data and going into databases, but there's not sort of system integrators going across the whole thing. So one of the things that, for instance, for me, it's been invaluable is to be able to be in a campus where the university library allows you to get for free access to all these scientific journals, uh, articles. And so I've had, you know, read you know, six or 700 of them. I couldn't do that if I wasn't in the campus. So there's a lot of this stuff that you just can't get to the data. Uh, now those barriers are, are very real. Now what the high school student did, I think, was a very different uh, approach. Um, so I don't, I don't think they're really comparable. Um, but I think it is going to be the you know, real issue is art is the coupling between translational medical researchers and this avalanche of data and whether you're actually going to get out of that data some new ideas for therapy or for treatment. So far, I haven't, but um, data itself doesn't translate into new therapy. While I like your question, I think you're incredibly unfair because I can turn this around and ask how many people in this room have patented in something in high school? It just doesn't happen. I mean, it, it's not, it, the, the, it's an interesting little story as an anecdote, but it's not something that you built a research enterprise upon. Uh, I was just going to say, patent don't actually mean anything. Uh, people come up with new patents. In surgery, we're notorious for coming up with new, new operations. There are more new operations every, every year than there are new uh, treatment uh, drugs, and a lot of them are never fully tested. Yeah, I have a question for, for James. That, uh, can you share with us how difficult it could be to link with Facebook to collaborate with them and get access to all of the huge data that you can access to. Thank you. So we're in a period right now where I think you have to have privileged access to some of these databases because of the privacy concerns that, that were referred to in the earlier session. Um, but th there are people at Facebook and at Twitter and at LinkedIn and these other resources that are very conscientiously thinking about the question, how do we get this data in more people's hands? Because the more people have access to it, the more you're, you're going to get um, new insights about social science and potentially new breakthroughs in terms of being able to change people's behavior for the better. Um, so it's, it's a difficult question because 
You want it to be as open as possible for the benefit of society, but you want it to be as close as possible for the benefit of the individual. So I, I want to probe this question we touched on earlier, but now we have a broader panel of different sociologies, I guess. Um, and it relates to the desire of, of, for data sharing. Um, I mean, sort of Frank said that uh, physicists are no better than biologists, but they're forced to be because they, they're, they're working off a large instrument and that sort of forces sharing. I mean, maybe I'm paraphrasing you incorrectly, but... Um, but it is kind of a, and then biologists tend to not share until they're published and then maybe they'll share. Uh, you know, and that seems, I'm, at the same time, no one's mentioned this, but the, there's a lot of activity in governments all over the world in this country, particularly through the Office of Science and Technology Policy, to effectively uh, engage researchers and uh, seriously encourage them to share. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering, if we've got more comments about this whole data sharing aspect, because it seems to me when you see all this cross-cutting work that it's, it's, it's almost critical, but then there's what comes down to is perhaps a desire to share, but on the other hand, there's uh, the reward system that uh, really in some ways works against it. So there's all this interplay at the institutional level, at the government level, and the individual level, and I'm just wondering what you know, people, the panel has to say about that. No, I mean, is, 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 uh, is data, sh well, let me make it simpler. Is data sharing different in different domains uh, by desire? I, I know that in the social sciences, the people who manage to pull off big, big data science end up getting amply rewarded. So I'm um, thinking of Joe Henrik and the project on small scale societies around the world. That's yielded two books and thousands of citations, probably a couple dozen articles. It was big big, small-scale social science. Um, you've got the, the paper that's just out recently with the psychologists who were replicating the, the um, experiments that had come under attack as not being replicable. Um, it was led by Brian Nosek. And I'm sure that his leadership of that project is going to help him personally in his career. So I think the more we have um, examples of people who expand their sort of short-term capital to organize other scientists, but then get rewarded later on, I think the easier it's gonna to be to say, this is a career path that you could take even if you're relatively junior. I, I would make, in addition to this, I would make a distinction between archival quality, or maybe not, quality is not the right word, but between primary data that has a, that uh, is, is, made of it that uh, is of common use versus private data that is your own competitive advantage. So I don't share my private data either with my collaborators. I have a group of 20 people or, or 30 people that I share my private data with, that I have produced, my group has produced. But the data that the experiment produces as a community, we all share. And so there is a starting point that is shared because that's the right thing to do and it makes sense. And then there is a derivative that the individual does in order to create yourself a competitive advantage. And I think that's also fair. And you have to make it possible that both coexist. And I don't know how that translates to other sciences, but it fundamentally, just from human nature and sociology, both must exist in some way, otherwise the, the, whole, the thing doesn't work. The system doesn't work. I don't know whether I'm making sense, but. I think part of the mentality that's out there is that the data is the new oil, and that's gonna have to change. <laughs> um, what we have seen, in the, there's obviously privacy and security issues with sharing the data and what you share and how you can share, and in smart grids, a lot of that is control, controlling the system on campus that we have to be careful what we can share. But what we have seen over the past year in our tech talks, for example, as the companies come and present about their data, it's really oftentimes not, in predictive analytics world, it's not oftentimes so much the data. It's the, the novel features they create out of that data that come from their domain experience and expertise, which is they won't share. Um, so as, as, as Frank has pointed out, there is data and then there is 
data. <laughs> I can tell about biology, which <laughs> you feel also know well. So in uh, working with many experiment, experimental labs and uh, working with a lot of data myself, I can say people are not, not willing to share data. They just don't know how and where. There is no infrastructure. For example, you know, beaut PDB is a beautiful case. You require people to submit the structure, obtain PDB ID, and only after that they can publish. So we are trying to do the same with the immune epitope database, which I'm working on. And it still didn't happen, actually. The database exists through, since 2004. And now we have nine years passed. And NIH still can't enforce that. So people submit data to our database, up, obtain ID, and then publish. So, and uh, like, for example, then a GEO um, archive uh, database for gene expression data was developed. And uh, people started submitting data there. And initially, it was only raw data, and then they allowed process data. And people do all that. Another issue that they don't do very well job is providing metadata, actually. And uh, for example, people are willing to submit supplements to the publications, but not every journal uh, actually allows to do that. So I think the major issue is infrastructure. So we need to develop infrastructure in different domains of science for people to share data. And they, the same like Facebook, if it would not exist, <laughs> no one would share data. Uh, there are infrastructures in place, but they're incredibly difficult to deal with when it comes to human subjects. So dbGaP is NIH's mechanism for sharing data, and I think it's like a 20 or 25 page application to get access to this data. It's insane. If, if my collaborator hadn't filled out that form and I could just sort of copy that form and to do the submission, I wouldn't be working with that data because it just wouldn't have been worth it to me. I would have gone somewhere else. So it's not just... It's not just creating new infrastructure, it's getting the infrastructure we have in place to work better and be lighter touch. Yeah, a question on just yeah, voting on Facebook. Just uh, in yeah, one of the experiments, you just yeah, specified just yeah, three different yeah, categories of close friends and then friends and then close friends of friends. And then uh, the goal was just the per, um, how they are predictive of our, for example, behavior. And I just yeah, noticed that, yeah, at some point, uh, just, yeah, the close friends of friends just exceeded just, yeah, the friends, <coughs> the predictivity of the friends. So any comment on that? Because intuitively, I just expect that friends are more influent on me, for example, than close friends of friends. Right, so I didn't present any of the results on close friends of friends in, in this. Um, and in the paper, we find that the close friends of close friends have an impact on online behavior, but on, on, not on real world behavior, as far as we can tell. If they do have an impact, it's, it's smaller than we can detect being different due to chance. But I, I didn't present those results. I just was focusing on the friends and the close friends. Thank you so We were given an example of a young, uh, well, I don't know, the uh, high school student or something like that who has searched um, the web and came up eventually with a patentable solution to one of the cancers. Here we had uh, Yulia Panamarenko showing us how to look at all of the data pretty much available in the universe of searchable biological data. And we have Larry Smarr with all of his resources and having his entire uh, genome sequenced and uh, I don't know how many years is this project. <clears throat> um, I think they're not the same case. Uh, this uh, is gonna be very valuable for <clears throat> actually the scientific research on things like the microbiome or uh, genomics that are just emerging, uh, in which the Do we have questions for the panel? Um, I'm going to... 
Oh, I, I, yes. Go ahead. I have that. So I'm going to challenge uh, maybe Larry Smart to participate with me in this question. At the beginning of our conference um, on the same campus, are you able to do what the high schooler did with the resources of this entire university? And uh, assuming that the answer is no, how actionable do you find this resource within your region? Well, 